pleasure to introduce Paul Kuo, who, uh, though he's only been in the Bay Area now for a few years, but he's been already a regular uh, for us to speak here at this meeting, also at our liver meeting. Um, he is the director of hepatology uh, at Stanford. Prior to that, a very distinguished career um, at Indiana University, and he has really been a seminal leader in a lot of viral hepatitis, especially hepatitis C treatments. Um, so please welcome Paul. Thank you, and um, after Carol's talk, thanks for sticking around and not taking the rest of the day off, okay? All righty, let's talk about liver disease and high impact presentations and posters of liver disease at GDW and EASL. I'm going to talk about some of the viral hepatitis, but Nora Thoreau will also cover them, and um, we have now coordinated our talks, so I think we will not overlap at all. So um, let's talk just first about hepatitis C. So uh, I'm sure all of you or many of you saw uh, that the Cochrane Group, which does a variety of systemic reviews, had reviewed the value of direct acting antiviral agents um, about a year ago and had come to a somewhat disturbing conclusion, which was that they uh, did not um, seem to have um, a effect on um, long-term outcomes, and in fact, their comment was that the clinical relevance of the effect of DAAs on no sustained virologic response is questionable, and that um, they feel that um, SVR as a sur surrogate outcome uh, was not yet validated. So I, I would like, and this uh, conclusion, uh, many of the organizations, ASLD, the European Association for the Study of Liver, Liver Disease, all questioned this uh, particular comment given their high efficacy. I would like to show some of the presentations now that show that indeed, uh, in addition to high efficacy, which we'll go over just briefly, but it's axiomatic that uh, direct acting antiviral agents cure hepatitis C, uh, but that we indeed have an impact on outcomes. So this was just published in Hepatology by Lisa Bacchus from the Palo Alto VA, and this actually showed that um, sustained response in mild fibrosis actually is associated with a reduction in mortality after just two years, and that's, she used a FIB4 uh, study here, but you can see here that if you had an SVR compared to no SVR, uh, that you had a mar uh, an improvement in mortality not related to those with advanced liver disease. Very interesting. So at the EASL uh, and DDW, there were a variety of presentations, again, showing the robustness and outcomes in some of these patients. This was a long-term follow-up study that Ira Jacobson uh, presented at DDW, and uh, in this one, he looked at long-term outcome and liver-related events in F2, F3 fibrosis, and again, this was in their uh, SVR registry. Uh, there were some liver-related events. There were a total of seven hepatocellular cancer um, that developed in the F2, F3, um, two in the F2 and uh, five in the F3 group, and interestingly, um, while they were um, rare, they still occurred, but they assessed fibrosis by the serum marker, the fibro test, and some of these liver-related events seem to occur in people who had s suggestive features of cirrhosis uh, by when they used other means to assess fibrosis. SVR is highly robust and durable, but the bottom line is when you are seeing these patients and you are assessing fibrosis, use multiple methods, and if you have discordant, if you have discordant values of fibrosis, that is, you get an elastography score, or if the serum markers don't line up there, even though you're getting mild fibrosis but the patient is thrombocytopenic, you have to resolve that, and occasionally still we do liver biopsies in these individuals who we can't um, determine accurately to what degree they have fibrosis, or we choose to follow them post-SVR. Uh, in cirrhotic patients, um, this was um, at the liver meeting, and this was, a, again, another cirrhosis registry uh, looking at the durability and outcomes in patients with compensated or decompensated cirrhosis who you cure with direct-acting antiviral agents. So you have here in red, tur child Turcotte pu A, and then B and C patients here. What you see over two-year follow-up is that more of the individuals shift to more compensated. That means more red here means more child Turcotte pu A patients. Uh, the, um, you also see here, whoops, excuse me. Um, you also see here that um, HCC incidence markedly reduces 
Um, the incidence is lower in both CTP A and B and C individuals here, um, and that SBR is quite uh, durable as well. And again, the HCC incidence, it doesn't go away, but it's clearly reduced, and this is what uh, the literature has demonstrated. Uh, there are some real-world uh, data that's been presented uh, at all of these meetings. We already know that for Ligipasvir, Sofosfavir, Grisoprovir, Elbosphere, there was uh, real-world data that was uh, robust. There were now real-world effectiveness data for Glucaprovir, Preventisvir, which is, again, our protease and our NS5A inhibitor, and this was the uh, Navigator study. Now, these results are early. This is 723 Italian uh, patients here, and the uh, fibrosis level you can see here, uh, it was um, still fairly low, but you can see here 7% cirrhotics. Uh, again, this is still early, uh, but the preliminary report here suggests that the SVR rates with this combination are essentially going to mirror their phase three registration trial data. This is not different than Lodiposphere, Sposphere. This is not different than Grisoprovir, Elbosphere, where the real world data mirrored the um, registration trial data as well. And again, here's a German study uh, that shows identical, if you will, uh, um, results uh, to the uh, Italian study, and this is the German hepatitis C registry um, and that you can see here. Again, the results are preliminary, 638 individuals, uh, a third are genotype 1, a third are genotype 3 thus far. Uh, the overall SVR rate, and notice here that of uh, this cohort of 600, just 92 have reported SVR 12, it's still early, uh, but you can see here uh, per protocol it's 100%. And uh, again, 97% um, is the attention to treat of the total effectiveness of the population, and it's quite um, effective. We're going to have to wait till all of these cohorts uh, complete their treatment, and then we can have a better assessment, but at least the preliminary data suggests that the SVR rates will be equally robust with this combination as it is uh, with all of our previous DAAs, and there's not really any reason to expect it won't be. So what about uh, cost effectiveness and uh, treatment of acute hepatitis C? Well, this was something that was just published in Hepatology. It's a Markov model. And what they did was they tried to uh, model in patients at risk of transmitting hepatitis C whether it's effective to treat acute hepatitis C. And uh, I, I just showed this to show you that um, what they showed was that in patients at risk of transmitting HCV, this is injection drug use individuals, that it's actually cost savings uh, to treat these individuals when you account for uh, reduction in transmission rates uh, for uh, a community. And why that was important was because of this very interesting um, paper that was presented um, at uh, EASL that came from Iceland. And uh, what they showed was that in their um, cohort, they had a marked reduction in the prevalence of hepatitis C among their persons who inject drugs during a second year of enrollment of their program, which was TRAP-HEP-C. Um, so this was a nationwide program started in January of 2016, uh, aimed to eliminate chronic hepatitis C. Um, now, it's Iceland, so just 1,000 individuals infected um, in, in, on the island there. Uh, and it took place at this uh, addiction hospital, which was their key sentinel site. So you can see here the number of patients who were hepatitis C positive. Um, in, uh, who presented through their hospital, you can see in 2015, about 160. By 2016, uh, it had dropped just slightly, but because of um, their scale-up of treatment, after two years of their TRAP-C protocol, 80 to 85 percent of the individuals who had presented were evaluated or initiated on DAA uh, therapy, and you can see here now the prevalence in 2000. 17 was 11.6%. Um, this is a 73% reduction, and this has um, been now represented as one uh, effective outcome when you really do try to uh, eliminate hepatitis C. Now, again, 
how this rolls out in, when you're not a country that's in an island a thousand miles from everywhere else, I think um, it will obviously, uh, that m makes it much easier uh, for Iceland to do this. But still, this was, uh, it, it shows that if we scale up and treat individuals at highest risk, that I think we're going to be able to make major inroads into reducing the prevalence of hepatitis C. And as all of you know, with the opiate epidemic, you know, we used to have the birth cohort from 1945 to 1965. And now we have a bimodal distribution. So the second peak, ages of 20 to 39, are because of the opiate epidemic. And we're going to have to uh, address that group uh, with substantial vigor in order to try and reduce the overall uh, prevalence of hepatitis C. Uh, what about disease outcomes after sustained virologic response? Uh, so again, this is uh, data that came uh, from EASL. And this was from the resist HCV cohort, these were almost 4,500 individuals who were treated with direct-acting antiviral agents from March of 2015 to December of 2016. And you had here, again, hepatitis. Uh, predominantly here, you had child A cirrhosis. This was um, almost 70 percent of the cohort here, and child B. And you can see that with SVR rate in the child TERCOP QA, you had a substantial improvement in liver-related mortality in over 3,000 individuals with child's A cirrhosis. There was also, interestingly, a small reduction in cardiovascular mortality as well. Again, uh, hepatitis C, as we learn, is, uh, is a systemic disorder. And it's interesting that we're starting to see outcomes in uh, aspects of disease other than liver-related outcomes. And again, so this um, report showed that we really do improve liver-related mo mortality at a significant rate for child TERCOP QA individuals. Uh, child TERCOP B cirrhosis individuals still seem to retain a significant risk of liver-related events. Regardless, you're going to follow these individuals uh, very, very closely. And when they looked at variables, um, an albumin of less than 3.5 and no SVR obviously were the highest predictors of um, liver-related events. So this was just an interesting poster that was, um, uh, or that was presented at EASL meeting that looked at uh, individuals who had relapsed after DAA therapy. Now, relapse is very uncommon. Just by show of hands, how many here has had a uh, relapse um, in their practice with DAAs? Um, I mean, Nora, you, yeah, you don't have to raise your hand, Nora. But but um, it, it, we see it rarely, right? I, I mean, there must be people, yeah, I'm sure there are people here who've had relapses. Um, this was an interesting study, the case control, looking to compare clinical and virologic of, uh, characteristics of patients with spontaneous clearance after relapse. There were 12 of them compared to those uh, with SVR or without relapse. And what they found was that they identified 12 individuals who they treated and then relapsed um, and then subsequently, these 12 went on to sustain virologic response. And what they noted was that when you had a relapse, you had the relapse level seemed to be low. That's not surprising. You're trying to regain, the immune system is trying to regain control over the hepatitis C virus. And the ALT levels were relatively uh, normal as well. So uh, again, you will not see this very frequently. Uh, but if you do, uh, particularly if they relapse with a low level of, vir of low level of virus, you should follow these individuals, not reinitiate treatment right away. There is an opportunity them, for them to, again, uh, clear uh, virus after you have documented a relapse, as long as the ALT level is low and the viral level doesn't appear to be uh, significantly elevated. So um, here's something that was also uh, a fun presentation, which was they asked the question, does alcohol or cannabis consumption diminish our sustained virologic response rates? Um, and uh, this was um, a German hepatitis C registry cohort study. And they looked at those on opiate substitution, uh, as well as those using drugs. And they also stratified by alcohol use. And oh, the, I'm sorry, the font didn't. So the SVR rates, you can see here, they did vary. They, some of them were as high as 90 percent. Some were a little lower as far as 79 percent. These were the intention to treat. But as you can see, alcohol use didn't really affect sustained virologic response rates. And in fact, um, if you look at then cannabis use, you can see green is yes. Uh, here you have magenta is no. And you can see, again, that if you're using cannabis and you're on opiate substitution, um, whether or not you're uh, an intravenous uh, drug use um, person, the SVR rates don't 
seem to affect in any way the sustained virologic response rates. So um, we do get high SDR rates in those in opiate substitution and non-opiate substitution individuals, but the long to follow-up rates seem to be relatively high. Cannabis use does not seem to influence these individuals um, um, either. Again, they do seem to not be uh, able to follow up as well. But again, uh, if we can treat these individuals, as I uh, think the data is now showing us, we will be able to reduce the overall prevalence of hepatitis C. Um, this was, again, a presentation from uh, Scotland and that showed the fruits of their efforts. So uh, Scotland has uh, really an impressive surveillance program for hepatitis C, and they prioritized individuals with advanced fibrosis. This was F2 fibrosis and higher to try and reduce, HC, um, to try and reduce the prevalence. And what they were trying to do was to reduce HCV-related decompensated cirrhosis by 75%, so they wanted to see their early impact here. And so here's the DAA era over here, uh, starting at 2014. And what you can see here is that since the introduction of the direct-acting antiviral agents, there were about 4,800 individuals who had started um, DAA therapy. And the uh, number of individuals um, now with decompensated liver disease, this is first-time uh, admissions for decompensated disease, um, and then again, first time decompensated disease who attained SVR prior to discharge, as well as decompensated all comers, everything is going down. So these prevalence rates now 29%, 39%. And again, they're seeing now a small increase in patients who have achieved SVR who still decompensate. Remember, that still can happen uh, despite, an S, uh, despite a, uh, achieving sustained virologic response. But you can see here uh, that we're making progress here. And again, this is, as this cohort from Scotland continues to report their data, it shows that an effort to treat those with advanced fibrosis is going to be important to reduce hospital admissions and again, reduce the overall rate of decompensation. Uh, this was a paper by Ray Kim uh, that looked at three cohorts, the SOLAR-1, SOLAR-2, and ASTRAL studies. All of those studies looked at direct-acting antiviral agents, Ledipasvir, Sofosvir, Sofosvir, Belpatasvir, uh, for those who are child B and C cirrhosis. And he modeled uh, cohorts that, um, based on UNOS data for untreated hepatitis C, uh, where he compared the natural outcome um, of the baseline cohorts from these three uh, studies, astral as well as the two solar studies, and he, he showed here the predicted number of deaths here. And this is based on UNOS data prior to the DAA era, and his models were highly robust. And then he looked at the actual outcomes uh, from the solar and astral cohorts, and what you can see here is that the observed deaths were markedly reduced compared to the expected number of deaths from a survival model, and there was a 54% reduction in uh, the mortality, uh, or 0.46 for the standardized mortality ratio. Uh, again, more uh, evidence that achieving sustained virologic response is going to be important. Now, Nora is going to talk a little bit about HCC and DAAs. Uh, this was a very interesting study that was uh, presented, and uh, I'm sure all of you who care for people with hepatitis C, see these individuals who present with hepatitis C cirrhosis, many have hepatitis cellular carcinoma, or you're following them for cirrhosis and they uh, have an indeterminate nodule. This study tried to look at interferon-free DA therapy uh, with or without patients with a history of hepatitis cellular carcinoma, and this was a fairly large group here, 11 160 individuals with no history of hepatoma, 125 with a history of hepatoma and complete response here. The overall SVR rates were very good, 96 and 95 percent, uh, but what they showed was that here's the cumulative probability of de novo HCC um, incidence. You can see here that in the individuals who had non-malignant nodules, that the probability of HCC was much higher. If there were no nodules on ultrasound, uh, the rate of HCC de novo um, um, formation was lower. And again, shown here, if you had undefined or non-malignant nodules on ultrasound, 
these were the nodules that appeared to be most likely to proceed, uh, and many of these transformed to hepatocellular carcinoma. So when you're treating these individuals, and I'm sure many of you have treated hepatitis C cirrhosis patients, and if you're like me, anecdotally, every now and then you will see a hepatoma that becomes biologically quite aggressive. Um, if there are indeterminate nodules, make sure they are well uh, characterized uh, and uh, carefully assess these nodules. These are individuals uh, that, uh, according to uh, the Italian data presented here, that are going to be at highest risk to transform and develop into uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So anyway, that was a very, that was a very interesting presentation. Uh, this was another uh, study from Italy which looked at 101 individuals who were completely treated and they underwent DAA therapy with a reasonable SVR rate, and roughly one-third of these individuals had a recurrence uh, with a natural history of untreated hepatitis C. This is really um, not, um, uh, this is not uh, too, to be too unexpected. Uh, half of the recurrences were a single nodule, excuse me, half were a single, and half were a multifocal recurrence, and the median follow-up you can see here was 22 months. SBR, again, as I tell you, um, and as the data has indicated, is associated with multiple positive benefits besides just getting rid of the virus. This was um, a study that was uh, presented by one of the um, outcomes individuals looking at a large database um, that assessed the risk of total non-hepatic cancers following treatment for hepatitis C. We know that SVR reduces hepatocellular cancer. Uh, what this study tried to do was look at different uh, non-hepatic uh, cancers, and they looked here at the adjusted total non-hepatic cancer-free survival. And um, what you can see here is that, indeed, there were reduced rates of leukemia, prostate, lung, and bladder cancers. Um, here are some of the other cancers associated with hepatitis C that we know about, non-Hodgkin's pancreas, bile duct, and uh, these did, um, did not appear uh, to um, be significantly reduced, but these four tumors were, and it seems that, um, again, the benefits of sustained virologic response don't seem to be limited to just our uh, hepatic outcomes. Portal hypertension also seems to improve. This was a uh, study, multicenter prospective study, in those who achieved sustained virologic response who had clinically significant portal hypertension by portal systemic gradients. And these are individuals, again, with a HVPG greater than 10 millimeters of mercury uh, that achieved sustained virologic response. And you can see here that they were assessed at SVR 24 and then also um, to, uh, at SVR 96. And you can see that the, here, that the mean um, portal systemic gradient slowly reduced, and that over time, here, that those with um, clinically significant portal hypertension that is greater than 10 millimeters, um, they did seem uh, to uh, reduce, and over time, uh, the individuals, all you can see here, that uh, the number of patients with high portal systemic gradients uh, seems to be uh, reducing over um, a period of 96 weeks. Again, the liver is probably remodeling, still have to follow these individuals, but portal hypertension does seem to take a while to get better. So we're going to transition to um, hepatitis uh, B. I think that actually um, Nora may be covering this, but I'm just going to say tenofovir, uh, disaproxil and tenofovir alafenamide are both effective uh, polymerase inhibitors for hepatitis B. Uh, tenofovir alafenamide is associated uh, with reduced uh, bone and renal injury parameters, and at easel, uh, this was a follow-up presentation that showed in the switch that the renal function seems to recover and the bone mineral seems to recover in those who received tenofovir uh, alafenamide, um, as opposed to those initially randomized to tenofovir disaproxyl. So um, this, uh, again, is uh, what tenofovir alafenamide's um, advantages are compared to tenofovir disaproxyl. They're both excellent um, um, antiviral agents toward hepatitis B. Uh, there are now new therapies for hepatitis B that are starting to come to our research clinics. And uh, this is, uh, there were some preliminary data, and it's early in hepatitis B so that we are going to see a variety of these small molecules and other uh, immunomodulatory therapies that are going to be 
coming to uh, the clinic. You're going to hear about them. If you have patients with hepatitis B who are interested in uh, potentially curing uh, these individuals, uh, or excuse me, enrolling into potentially curative or studies at clear surface antigen, there are major medical centers all around here. I would avail you to um, re refer your patients if they're interested. This was a core or capsid assembly modulator, which is the same thing as a core inhibitor. The nomenclature is still a bit um, confusing because they're all the same uh, class of medicine. So this was a J&J &J capsid assembly modulator uh, that uh, inhibits the formation of the core, uh, where initially the RNA and then the DNA is inserted. And they looked at an ascending dose, 25, 75, and 150 milligrams administered orally uh, for 28 days. And what you see here is not only the HBV DNA levels, but the HBV um, RNA uh, levels as well. And what you can see here is that in, a, in ascending doses that you have substantially reduced HBV DNA as well as um, HBV RNA levels with uh, no relevant changes thus far in surface antigen. So this is, again, a core promoter, as I will show you another one shortly. This hopefully will be one contributing class of medicines that can lead to what we call a so-called functional cure. And um, this afternoon, Nora is going to talk a little bit more uh, about some of the nomenclature that has been um, introduced. But this J&J &J 6379 uh, seems to reduce the viral level. It's just a four-week study. It's early, but it's promising. We'll have to see how it um, plays out long term. Uh, this is another if these so-called core promoter inhibitors. Uh, this one is an oral small molecule. Um, and this was a phase one uh, report looking at safety PK. Um, and again, here you can see the absolute change in HBB DNA. So you have very here high, lo high levels of virus, low levels of virus, excuse me. The E antigen positive individuals typically have higher levels of virus. The E antigen negative typically have lower levels. And what you can see here in this uh, particular study was that you had um, here, as you initiate therapy over, again, 28 days, you had robust reductions in uh, the HBB DNA over time. And then, of course, you withdraw therapy. And uh, not surprisingly, you're going to see rebound. Here's your one placebo here. Uh, um, uh, here, this is G, just showing that um, there's no viral um, kinetic change whatsoever. Again, it's early, but the core promoter class uh, looks to be one class that deserves uh, further investigation. This was um, a very interesting class of molecules that is um, something that we have not seen, I think, in, at least in viral hepatitis uh, before. And this is the nucleic acid polymer class. And this was a, um, this was a rep uh, 2139. And so that um, what this seems to do is that um, this rep uh, 2139 uh, by being a uh, nucleic acid polymer, it seems to block the subviral particles. Why is this important? So <clears throat> all, almost all of the hepatitis B surface antigen that is um, in the system, and uh, you know the majority of the um, serum, the concentration of these surface antigen particles is very high, it is mostly derived from integrated HBV DNA. And when you target viral replication with our nucleotide nucleoside polymerase inhibitors. This is tenofovirs or entecavir, or as I just showed you, the core promoter, at least at, four, uh, tw at 28 days, you didn't see really much meaningful change in the surface antigen. Um, so you do need to try and clear surface antigen because um, this model seemed to indicate that if you clear surface antigen, it restores functional control of the immune system. So these surface antigen particles mask the anti-hepatitis B surface antibody response, and they also contribute to exhaustion of B and T cell responses and inhibit the activity of a variety of cytokines as well. So um, wh whoops, sorry. Um, so what this nucleic acid polymer does is it blocks the subviral assembly and release from CCC DNA or integrated HBB DNA um, here, and it only prevents replenishment of this hepatitis B surface antigen particles. So that's the background on this class. 
<clears throat> and if you clear surface antigen, um, then you can restore hep B immune function. So this was just reported about a month ago in Toronto. So they looked at um, hepatitis B antigen negative individuals. And um, as uh, you will see, this is the group that is hardest to clear surface antigen. And they had two groups here. They all received tenofovir for 24 weeks. Then one group also got tenofovir plus peg interferon for 24 weeks, followed by their nucleic acid polymer here. The other group got nucleic acid polymers, tenofovir, and peg interferon. And notice they're all getting interferon. You need some kind of um, immune stimulation in order to clear these surface antigen molecules. So this group um, received um, earlier the uh, nucleic acid polymer here, it was delayed by 24 weeks. But look at the surface antigen um, levels here. So again, with nucleotide polymerase, just tenofovir, which is the first 24 weeks, not surprisingly, surface antigen doesn't budge. That's what we would expect. But when you add the nucleic acid polymer with um, um, here in uh, this lower cohort, look at the surface antigen. They fall, and they fall, some of them, dramatically. And um, in these individuals, um, there was 24 of 40 had hepatitis B surface antigen loss, okay? Some had very low significant reductions as well without loss, and surface antibody was produced. Um, and again, um, you can see here, the second line here is the top cohort here at week 48 when they had the nucleic acid polymer introduced. And you can see here, again, the uh, viral part, uh, the surface antigen levels fell. And this again is surface an E antigen negative individuals. Um, HBV DNA, not surprising. You're getting tenofovir, potent suppression, it stays suppressed. It's early, but again, um, this class of molecules also looks quite promising. Switching now to non alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, so there were several presentations. Uh, this one uh, shows, and this is not surprising, we're all seeing this, that the uh, proportion of individuals um, who are undergoing liver transplant for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis has risen more for any other indication in Europe, same thing is going to be true in the U.S., and that there's a significantly higher proportion of individuals with concomitant hepatocellular carcinoma as well. Um, and so this was um, this um, study from the European or the ELTR transplant registry on 68,000 individuals here. And um, again, um, so far NASH doesn't affect post-transplant survival, uh, but we're all going to have to continue to evolve uh, toward managing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's going to be the dominant uh, force in our transplant population. Um, this a uh, particular multicenter study uh, looked at a variety of populations from Italy, Spain, Netherlands, and UK. And what they found, again, was uh, that there is an increased risk of incident NAS cirrhosis as well as hepatocellular carcinoma. This was an electronic medical uh, database um, query here. And what you can see here is that NAFLD, NASH, and the combination were associated with cirrhosis, and not surprisingly, again, with hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, we're all, again, it, we're all going to have to learn to uh, uh, care for these individuals. And again, the, particularly in those with advanced fibrosis, screening for hepatocellular carcinoma is going to be essential as this group uh, seems to um, contribute now a substantially greater number of hepatocellular cancers uh, than uh, we have previously recognized. There are multiple phase three trials that are being reported uh, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This was one, this was Sinacriberoc, um, which is a CCR2 or chemo and CCR5 chemokine receptor inhibitor. Uh, this is results from the phase two study. Uh, year one, they had this antifibrotic response of, um, of, um, that was substantial, and you can see here uh, that by year two compared to placebo, 60% maintained a one stage improvement in uh, fibrosis, and some individuals actually, 11% actually um, achieved improvement in fibrosis by two stages without uh, worsening of their non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Again, there's a large phase three trial that's enrolling, uh, and we'll have to see um, how um, the outcomes of that, that's gonna take a while uh, to be reported. Uh, but again, in the phase two study, it seems like their um, results uh, remain robust in the second year. 
there are, just like for hepatitis B, there are going to be a numerous, um, and there are going to be numerous small molecules and other therapeutic strategies uh, to try and treat non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This was one of the more interesting ones. Um, it's this novel molecule MGL3196, which is a thyroid hormone receptor beta agonist uh, that was given to 125 individuals with biopsy-proven non-alcoholic steatohepatitis with an endpoint of um, reduction in um, fat. And what you can see here is that the, prior, the primary endpoint here um, was that by um, MRI PDFF, and this is proton density fat fraction, that you can see here the high dose of this beta thyroid hormone receptor you can see here was actually um, the fat uh, improved substantially. And this was, again, the number of individuals who had a 30% reduction in fat. Uh, lipids also reduced, um, and then by assessment of liver stiffness uh, by this uh, multiparametric MRI PDFF, um, you can also see uh, that um, it appears that liver stiffness as a surrogate marker for hepatic fibrosis is also reduced. Again, first study, it's early, uh, but again, this is uh, another uh, promising study that's going to have to move forward. Uh, there are many different approaches. This was a, a report looking at combinations of uh, small molecules here. Uh, so we have here uh, solinsertib, which is an apoptosis signaling kinase inhibitor. You have here GS0976. This is the acetyl carboxylase inhibitor. And finally, an FXR agonist is G69674. And uh, either as monotherapy or as combinations, these have been, these have been tested in individuals with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and F2, F3 uh, fibrosis. And again, the endpoints here, change in liver fat and liver stiffness in this phase two study. And what you can see is that the single agents as well as the combinations all seem to improve uh, by MRI. This is by um, here, this is fat content. You can see here that all of these molecules, um, relatively speaking, except for the, um, here the apoptex signal kinase inhibitor seem to reduce fat. ALT seems to improve. And again, here, uh, the FXR had the best improvement in GGT as well. Uh, liver stiffness, as you can see here, also improves. These are percent changes, but um, over a 12-week period, you can see all of these also seem to reduce. Uh, again, not histological outcomes, but it's still uh, promising. So what can we do now? So this was an uh, interesting uh, poster that was um, presented, and this looks at this Q Weekly uh, P, uh, P, um, PD, excuse me, GLP-1 um, agonist, which is used for diabetes. This is semaglutide. There are a variety of them that are approved now. And I realize as gastroenterologists, hepatologists, we're not prescribing this, but um, this class might be considered helpful in those who have um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They actually did a retrospective review of their database and non-diabetic patients, post hoc analysis and 513 people, non-diabetic adults with an elevated ALT. And what they found was that the ALT declined and often normalized after 52 weeks here. And so that, again, uh, we, this is not an approved therapy, though there are studies that have been published um, with other GLP-1s um, agonists that have shown that actually you can improve non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So if you have patients with diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, my advice is that as long as they don't have um, any GI issues, you can't give this drug with gastroparesis, but this, you might work with their family physician or their diapedologist to say this is a class for uh, this particular uh, patient. If it's indicated for the diabetes, it would have an added benefit. And then uh, finally, this very interesting presentation uh, on this FG19 hormone here, and NGM282 uh, was presented. Um, this FGF19 has multiple biological activities here, and it reduces steatosis, it increases insulin sensitivity, increases fatty acid oxidation, reduces lipotoxicity. And it was given in a single center study uh, right here for 12 weeks. And what they found was in the just 22 patients with biopsy confirmed non-alcoholic steatohepatitis from stage one to three fibrosis, what they found was that there were absolute and uh, significant reductions 
in liver stiffness by PDFF uh, after 12 weeks of this hormone. There were also uh, reduction of fibrosis markers as well as reduction in serum bile acids, which just demonstrates that the, it's hitting its target. So here are a variety of fibrosis markers. This is the ELF score, and these are other um, fibrosis-associated proteins. And then uh, Pro-C3, Pro-Collagen-3 levels, also another marker of fibrosis. They all markedly were reduced over 12 weeks. Fibrosis, so this is one of the few that had a biopsy at week 12, which is actually fairly short. And there were substantial individuals, number of individuals, 42%, that had improvement in fibrosis. Um, just after 12 weeks. By PDFF, um, you'll have to take my word on this, that uh, liver stiffness also improved. And what you can see again here is that the NAS score improved in almost everybody um, as well, with improvements in steatosis, ballooning, and inflammation seen in anywhere from 42 to 74% of individuals. Again, a very interesting hormone. It's early. We'll have to see how it uh, transpires in larger studies, but um, this seems to be another promising uh, pathway to explore in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So alcoholic liver disease um, is, is probably, depending on how you read the UNOS database, is the most common indication for liver transplant, or one of the second most common, and um, th this um, now has led to us being confronted with a variety of patients we all care of these individuals young, acute injury, alcoholic hepatitis, not sober for six months, and many of these individuals die. So people are trying to tease out um, how we can offer in these young individuals um, orthotopic liver transplant to the appropriate populations without having high relapse rates and reductions in survival. Um, and so there was a study at DDW looking at the Mayo Scottsdale groups, and they looked at 203 individuals who underwent liver transplant for the first time due to alcoholic liver disease. There were 28 relapses, um, and they were younger um, than those who did not relapse. And um, these individuals who were transplanted under their exception pathway, the relapse rate was also higher, 40 to 12.4%. Uh, 12 There's a multicenter trial looking at this as well. Uh, you know, we um, at our own institution, this is institution dependent, we all uh, we have crafted our own exception pathway for these individuals, uh, but these decisions are very difficult, and we have to balance the stewardship of the donors uh, with, again, trying to make sure that some of these younger individuals um, who come in with acute alcoholic injury um, do not die if there is an appropriate therapy. Uh, at the uh, EASL meeting, there was a study looking at the use of baclofen. This was an open-label study. Baclofen is this GABA receptor agonist, which reduces alcohol cravings. And what they showed was that um, if they, these individuals in this, at uh, multiple different um, centers in France were given baclofen, that you seem to reduce the alcohol consumption. And the ACG guidelines that were just released by B.J. Shaw's group here showed um, that um, indeed, baclofen um, is um, one uh, potential effective therapy in reducing, uh, preventing alcohol relapse. I myself have not used it much, but uh, after this poster, I think uh, it's certainly worth uh, a therapy that's worth consideration. Just quickly shifting to autoimmune liver diseases, uh, PBC, primary biliary cholangitis, is treated. First-line therapy is ursodiol. Uh, we do have therapies uh, that are salvaged if you don't respond, including obeta-cholic acid, and there are a variety of these uh, other uh, similar uh, molecules that are now being targeted toward urso non-responders. This was a study from the global PBC study, 3,900 individuals. And what they did was they looked at liver transplant-free survival in individuals who did not respond to uh, ursodial either by no change in the alkaline phosphatase or no reduction in the bilirubin. And what they found was that even if you did not respond, uh, that you still seem to have a prolonged tra um, transplant-free survival. And that's shown here in the middle here in both of these, uh, so that even without a, uh, the traditional response to ursodial, there seemed to be uh, some benefit of urso administration. Um, interesting um, observation. Primary sclerosing cholangitis, we don't have any good options, and this is probably the disease which we have that we need the greatest number of novel therapies for, because this um, is a disease that affects young individuals, typically young males. Uh, they have a uh, relapsing course, 
and uh, liver transplant is really the only option there at risk for cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, this was a Swedish registry uh, that looked at a variety of uh, factors associated with all-cause mortality, and interestingly, they found that statin use was associated, or statin exposure was associated with a significant reduction in all-cause mortality, as well as mortality and liver transplantation. Uh, statins are good for a variety of things. They seem to reduce your, uh, also your risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, again, this does not mean go out and use statins, but uh, again, where indicated, statins should be considered in individuals with um, P um, PSC if their lipid profiles are appropriately um, in the area where uh, they feel that they will be a benefit. Um, I showed you the NGM282 uh, for NAFLD, and I showed you how impressive, impressive it was. They also studied this in PSC, and the bottom line was their primary outcome, which was alkaline phosphatase, was not met. But all of the other markers, including this pro-collagen uh, C3 fell, um, and bile acids fell, so enhanced liver fibrosis, ELF score fell. So everything actually got better in these PSC patients, but the primary outcome um, was not uh, met here. Uh, so they still are going to explore this. Um, moving forward. Um, we're going to stop that because we're getting a little low on time. So in summary, real-world data, Gleepib shows that it's as robust as the other DAAs. The benefits of SVR are becoming more apparent uh, through not only liver-related outcomes but non-liver-related outcomes. Um, Nor is going to talk about discontinuation of nucleoside nucleotides. Um, there are novel agents for hepatitis B that are coming. It is still early. If your patients are interested, please look for clinical trial of choice. For NAFLD, lots of trials out there if your patients are interested in the F2, F3, F4 populations. Um, GLP-1, it's not approved for NAFLD, but if you have type 2 diabetes of appropriate, you should consider it. Still lots of benefits for ursodiol, and even if without a response, it seems to be helpful. And obviously, a beta-cholic acid is for, there for non-responders if you need it. Um, PSC, multiple trials in place. Statins, if appropriate, may be beneficial. Alcoholic liver disease, more data are going to be required. I, I think we are going to have to try to uh, craft an, um, an exception pathway. Many centers have it, but it's always disappointing to care for somebody who's relapsed, but addiction is a disease. Um, we're just going to have to balance there uh, the risks. And finally, baclofen, there was a preliminary report that it could be combined with other strategies to reduce relapse. Um, that was quite a whirlwind, Eric. Sorry about that. But um, that's a potpourri of what my life has been about for the last two months. So thank you. I probably bombarded them, that's my guess. Okay.